Today on Newswatch, President Trump taking action to build that wall and giving the green light on the Keystone Pipeline. We'll get you up to date on the latest White House activity. And Obama was called the abortion president. Now Trump is being called the pro-life president. See why pro-life groups are so excited about what's coming next. Plus a musical about the biblical story of Ruth. And you won't believe which communist country it's playing in. Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Lori Johnson. President Trump is moving forward with one of his most controversial campaign promises, building a wall on the U.S.-Mexican border. The president is rolling out executive actions on that and other immigration measures, including refugees. Heather Sells has more. The president tweeted the news on his personal Twitter account, saying, we will build the wall. The plan, a measure to jumpstart construction. He's also expected to take other decisive action on immigration this week, like a four-month halt on all refugee admissions and a shorter ban on people coming from Muslim-majority countries. The news comes as the administration continues to defend the president's belief that millions of illegal votes were cast in November. I think he stated his concerns of uh, voter fraud and, and people voting illegally during the campaign. And he continues to maintain that belief based on studies and evidence that people have presented to him. The president is also moving ahead on the economy. On Tuesday, he met with the heads of the big three U.S. car makers and other automobile leaders, promising to streamline the environmental permitting process and make the U.S. business friendly. We're bringing manufacturing back to the United States big league. We're reducing taxes very substantially and we're reducing unnecessary regulations. In another move aimed at strengthening the economy, Trump signed executive orders to move forward with construction of the Keystone XL and Dakota Access pipelines. And Trump says that he'll soon announce perhaps most his important nominee, his choice for a new justice on the Supreme Court to replace the late Antonin Scalia. We have outstanding candidates and we will pick a truly great Supreme Court justice. The leading candidates are three federal judges who are all strong conservatives. A top contender right now, Neil Gorsuch, who is known as a judge in the mold of Scalia, interpreting the Constitution and laws based on their original meaning. Also on the shortlist, William Pryor, who once called the Roe v. Wade decision legalizing abortion an abomination. And Thomas Hardiman, known for his support of gun rights. The president says he'll announce his decision next week. Heather Sells, CBN News. The Senate has overwhelmingly approved President Trump's nominee for U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. The South Carolina governor won strong support for the U.N. post, senators voting 96 to 4 to approve Haley's nomination. The chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, Bob Corker, endorsed Haley, saying she would be a fierce advocate for American interests at the U.N., Meanwhile, Senate committees also paved the way for three more of Trump's cabinet nominees to be approved in just days, including Ben Carson for the Housing Department. President Trump has made it clear he will treat Israel as a true ally and even move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now Israel has announced plans to build 2,500 more settlements in the so-called West Bank. The move comes despite opposition from pro-Palestinian forces that consider the settlements illegal. Trump is considered to be friendly toward the settlement movement, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wrote in a Facebook post on Tuesday that Israel, quote, will continue to build in Judea and Samaria. President Trump is inheriting a dangerous world. America's rivals believe it is now weaker because of President Obama's foreign policy. And history has shown that a weak America can easily lead to trouble. Our CBN News European reporter Dale Hurd brings us this look at the twin challenges from the countries of Russia and China. Half a world away from a peaceful transfer of power, things are anything but peaceful. American forces began deploying in Poland this month because the Eastern Europeans are afraid. They're afraid of this. The Russian army, 
All along the border with Russia, former members of the Soviet Union worry Vladimir Putin will be tempted to test NATO and take back what once belonged to Moscow. In the Pacific, this could one day be sailing off the California coast. You're looking at a new aircraft carrier battle group of the growing Chinese Navy, the first of three carrier battle groups to be deployed by 2020. For all of Barack Obama's boasting that he could manage foreign affairs better than George W. Bush, critics say Obama has made a mess of American foreign policy, emboldening enemies and making Donald Trump's job much harder. The new president will have to lead in a world that is less stable than the one Barack Obama inherited eight years ago. Amid unraveling alliances and the perception of U.S. weakness, America's rivals could test Trump early to see if he has the guts to stand up to them. The tiny Baltic states are especially worried about a sudden thrust by Russian forces across their border. Vladimir Putin called the fall of the Soviet Union one of the greatest geopolitical disasters of the 20th century. He's taken back Crimea and is helping Russian separatists in Ukraine. He's placed Russian missiles in the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad in the middle of NATO's eastern flank. Putin is a thug, a bully, if you will, and a bully respects power. They do not respect people who have power, but who lack the will to use it. In the Pacific, China is moving to annex most of the South China Sea, building artificial islands and claiming territorial boundaries that place it on a direct collision course with the United States, which has pledged to keep sea lanes open. China has unmistakably perceived Obama as weak and acquiescent to their ambitions. These twin threats in the Pacific and in Europe could be difficult for any future president to navigate peacefully. Dale Hurd, CBN News. The White House is rejecting accusations that President Trump has overlooked civil rights and minority concerns. Critics say Trump's black visitors to Trump Tower were mainly celebrities like Kanye West and comic Steve Harvey, not civil rights activists. But White House spokesman Sean Spicer said Tuesday that Trump already met with important leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. III and Reverend Alveda King. The House has passed legislation to ban the use of federal money for nearly all abortions. The measure would also block tax credits for some who are buying abortion coverage under Obamacare. Republicans passed a similar bill in 2015, but President Obama threatened to veto the legislation. GOP lawmakers say the bill has a better chance under President Trump, but it needs to go through the Senate first, where it could face considerable opposition from Democrats. Pro-life Americans are among the happiest with Donald Trump's victory. He has made a lot of promises, and this week he already delivered, cutting off funding for abortion groups overseas. Now pro-life organizations and politicians are ready to push hard for more progress on a number of anti-abortion fronts. Paul Strand has more. This is the moment that the pro-life movement has been waiting for. It's like nothing we've ever experienced before, quite frankly. That's former Congresswoman Marilyn Musgrave and Mallory Quigley at the Susan B. Anthony List, one of the nation's leading pro-life groups. We are poised to make great gains for the movement. Republicans in the last Congress knew if they could get any kind of pro-life measure through there, it'd surely be vetoed by President Obama. But it's a whole new ballgame now with a President Trump. He is pro-life. He has uh, stood up, defended pro-life. And of course, Mike Pence, our VP elect, has a wonderful pro-life record. Uh, we were facing an existential threat to the unborn had Hillary Clinton won. Barack Obama was the abortion president, but she would have doubled down and made it even worse domestically and internationally. So uh, we've gotten the reprieve of sorts in terms of, of this all-out assault. The Trump-Pence team have made four commitments to the movement. Probably the most important one is nominating pro-life justices. Since when do we uh, get a clear indication whether or not uh, someone who's nominated is pro-life? So that is absolutely amazing. Another commitment? First thing on the agenda this year, of course, is redirecting Planned Parenthood's taxpayer funding to the more than 18,000 community health centers that exist across this country. Representative Blackburn has headed up the special panel investigating Planned Parenthood's selling of baby body parts to businesses who traffic in those. The woman with the fetus became a profit center 
for each of these two entities. And to me, that is absolutely disgusting. It is illegal. It is a felony, a 10-year felony, to sell a human body part in this country. So what we will do is go about defunding the abortion industry. A third commitment. Promoting the Unborn Child Pain Capable Act talking about banning abortion after the fifth month. A majority of Americans are on our side. They want to see a common sense restriction to stop abortion after five months when the baby can feel pain. And the fourth commitment, making the Hyde Amendment, which has been renewed every year since 1976, permanent. Codifying Hyde, uh, stopping our tax dollars from going for abortion. That idea is also popular with the public. They want to see conscience rights protected, whether that's taxpayers, whether it's medical professionals that don't want to be participating in abortions. People need to focus on what abortion actually does. It chemically poisons or it dismembers a baby, uh, piece by piece. It is horrific, it's horrendous, it's cruelty, and we need to stop it. Pro-life forces have been waiting for years to pass all sorts of anti-abortion measures here in Washington, and now is their best chance in years with both a Republican Congress and a Republican president. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Capitol Hill. Coming up, biblical entertainment in communist China. How Christians are working to reach Chinese families through the theater. The Chinese New Year is fast approaching. For the first time, the nation is about to embrace a new way to celebrate the traditional holiday. A musical about the biblical story of Ruth is being performed nationwide. Christian artists are hoping the message can deliver the message of Jesus to more unbelievers. Meng Fei Li explains more. This is a performance that has never been seen before in China. During the Chinese New Year holidays, theater goers will have the opportunity to see the biblical story of Ruth on national stages. Many have never heard of the story which is centered on the true love relationship between Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. The show producers are hoping the play may improve family relationships. Modern Chinese newlyweds often have difficulties getting along with their in-laws, Without proper guidance on solving the conflicts, families split up. For many young Chinese women, maintaining family unity can be challenging. As a woman, pleasing my mother-in-law is my top priority. I don't want my husband knowing his mom doesn't like me. Family strife is one of the reasons why the divorce rate in China is rising. According to a state media report, nearly 4 million couples ended their marriages in China in 2016. That's a 5.6% increase from 2014. Christians are hoping young Chinese may receive biblical guidance from attending the performance. The story shows how to maintain strong family relationships. We've worked hard to make the play biblically accurate. The younger generation enjoys the theater, and we're making efforts to make the story more relevant to them. During the production process, some of the crew members sought wisdom and guidance from the Lord. The only question I thought about the whole time was, how should we present this Christian story? I knew many broken Chinese families need to know the story. The conflicts among family members in China are greater than ever. This could be the chance to heal some of the broken relationships. I pray the spirit could make miracles. The cast was only given 40 days to rehearse before the public opening. The directors work hard to deliver Ruth's message in a simple way. We created additional characters within this play. We want the audience to know wrongdoers are just a part of life. However, the righteous will always win the battles in the end. The sets and lining design allow viewers to feel as if they were taken back to the biblical period. We invited historians from Israel to design the stage scenes along with the music with us. Hopefully, our audience is going to enjoy the time travel experience. Cast members are professional actors and actresses, a milestone in Chinese Christian theater history. During the rehearsals, some of the actors revealed they had never heard of the Old Testament or the story of Ruth. Some said they were deeply touched by her story. 
Christian cast members began to share with them how Jesus changed their lives, and at least the one actress accepted Christ. When I rehearsed the lines, I didn't quite understand Ruth's lesson about God until I became a Christian. For many Chinese Christians, being part of this play is also a way to rekindle a relationship with Jesus Christ. For so long, I haven't had time to read the Bible on my own. I used to make excuses to the Lord. While I was practicing the lines, I had the opportunity to read the Bible. I felt the Lord is inviting me to be united with Him again. This play challenged my walk with the Lord. Not only are the Christian artists in this musical hoping for a positive nationwide response, they're also praying the Chinese audience will develop an interest in knowing other biblical truths. Meng Fei Li, CBN News. Up next, is your child having a tough time in math? Maybe he needs more time at recess. We'll give you the skinny on the power of play when we come back. Parents have always counted on recess at school for their children to get regular exercise. Now we're learning that recess is not only good for their bodies, it's also good for their minds. But in recent years, recess has been slowly squeezed out of the school day. Take a look at your shape. This is the picture most people visualize when thinking about improving education. But what about this? Yes, recess could be just as important. 80% of school principals surveyed said recess improves learning. I have seen an, an increase of test, test scores, especially uh, in math. Following a half-hour recess, a majority of principals say students listen better and are more focused in class. The benefits can be felt way beyond the classroom. Psychologist and author David Elkind says rote learning alone creates a nation of factory workers, while unstructured play creates innovators because it fosters fantasy, imagination, and creativity. Those are like muscles, and if you don't use them, you lose them. And so when we don't allow children to engage in self-initiated, spontaneous play, then they don't nourish those abilities. But despite these benefits, it's disappearing from the school day. All across America, school playgrounds are sitting idle because teachers are canceling recess and using that time to get in a little extra instruction. Teachers feel pressured to make sure their kids meet testing requirements, and there are other reasons. The most surprising finding of the survey is that schools actually still use recess as a punishment, so that if children are misbehaving, recess is often the one thing that they take away from them. Parents are often unaware their children are missing recess, and when their kids do have it, parents often don't know what type it is. For instance, indoor, playing board games, or outdoor, running around, blowing off steam. Although teachers sometimes bristle at cold weather recess, for kids it's usually a good idea. Exercise at recess addresses the epidemic of childhood obesity, and now there's the added benefit of good mental health. Recess is usually the only time kids have self-created play. After school, it's no longer safe to let kids roam most neighborhoods, and children are often overscheduled with structure. One of the things about kids who haven't enough time to play is they get bored very quickly uh, because they've never had an opportunity and never had the time to engage in activities, create their own activities, and so on. And they always have things given to them. And so when they're left with free time, they don't know what to do, and therefore they call them bored. So if parents and teachers understand recess improves learning, they can ensure it's an important part of every school day. So how much recess time are your kids getting at school? I bet you don't know. I didn't when my kids were going to school. Ask your teachers, their kids' teachers, and push for more. It's good for the mind and the body. Blow off all that extra steam. We'll be right back. Four-year-old Amala has a bright smile that can light up any room. And now, thanks to CBN supporters, she has a bright future as well. Take a look. Amala is an energetic and happy little girl. 
She's always singing, and she wants to do everything I do, even if it's something as simple as washing dishes. Amala's parents always do their best to show her how much they love her. But when her fourth birthday arrived, they were faced with a difficult choice. She asked us why there wasn't any cake or presents. I tried to explain that if we got cake, we would have no food for the rest of the week. She just didn't understand. Every morning, Amala watched her friends walk to the local daycare center. Her parents couldn't afford the fees there, so she had to stay home. She cried and told me she wanted to go with her friends. It was just another thing she wanted that we could not give her. Then Life Child, a ministry supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise, learned about Amala. We enrolled her in the daycare and paid all of her fees. Now, during the day, she's learning lots of new things, and she finally gets to play with her friends. I love it here. At home, I only have one toy, but here I have many toys and many friends. During one of their Bible lessons, the teacher asked the class who wanted to be Jesus' friend. Every little hand went up, except Amila's. I didn't raise my hand because I first wanted to go home and clean myself up. I didn't want to be dirty when I met Jesus. Soon, Amila's parents gave their hearts to Christ too. Amila is the one who taught us to pray, something we never did before. Through the daycare, I have realized how important education is. I know now that the most important thing is the Bible and our relationship with God. And to help the family earn a steady income, CBN got Amila's mother enrolled in sewing classes. Soon she'll be starting her own business. So the next time Amala's birthday comes around, she'll have plenty of cake and presents. I no longer worry she will have the same childhood I had. She has a bright future ahead of her. Thank you, CBN. So precious. Well, that's it for now on CBN Newswatch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care about most at CBNNews.com. We hope you'll join us again next time. Have a great day, everyone.